Hi everyone. Hi everyone in the room. Hi everyone uh, online. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is David Kershaw. I'm the, the Dean of the LSE Law School here. Um, now, obviously it's a statement of uh, the seriously obvious that um, uh, the events happening in Ukraine are catastrophic for the people living in Ukraine, catastrophic for, uh, uh, for many of our members of our community in, in, in the law school, in, uh, in LSE as a whole, and in our alumni uh, community. Um, now, what we're trying to do here at the LSE, um, in light of these events and in light of the profound consequences of these events in so many different areas of our lives. What we're trying to do is bring us together to have multiple conversations about these impacts. So we had an event on international law last week. We had an event on EU law and Ukraine last night. Uh, we've got one today on the Ukraine and the effectiveness of financial sanctions. We have another couple coming up in the next two weeks. I hope you can join us. We have uh, one next week on the, the Ukraine and uh, the legal ethics of client selection looking at the role of lawyers uh, in this context that has come into acute relief. And then we'll have another one uh, either next week or the week after. We're currently planning it on uh, uh, um, international law and uh, the politics of, uh, of uh, the invasion of Ukraine. So we've got a lot going on. I hope you can join us for much of this. Uh, today, we're looking at the Ukraine and the effectiveness of financial sanctions. Um, and I'm very, very grateful and honored to have a really fantastic uh, panel of speakers. Uh, we've got four speakers, each of whom are going to speak for around about seven to eight minutes, uh, and then uh, uh, we'll have questions and open up, uh, uh, open up to questions online and in the room. Uh, we've got Anna Bradshaw from Peter and Peters. Peter and Peters is one of the UK's leading financial uh, sanctions and economic crime uh, law firms here in London. Anna is joining us uh, online. Um, we have Elena Chachko from uh, at the Harvard Law School. She's the Rappaport uh, Fellow at the Harvard Law School, also uh, an academic fellow at the Miller Center for Global Challenges uh, mm -hmm. at uh, Berkeley. Uh, we have Lee Jones, who's a professor of international politics at, at Queen Mary University of London. And we have John Danielson, who's a reader in finance here at the LSE and also director of uh, uh, the LSE's uh, Systemic Risk Center. Uh, so, Anna, if I may, if I could ask you to join us first and, and give us your comments, and then we'll go to Elena, and then we'll go to Lee, and to John, and then we'll open it up for conversation. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to have been invited to speak to you today on such an important topic, and one which has kept at least the legal community in London um, without sleep for the last two weeks. It's been a real uh, busy time and a period of great uncertainty. And it is uh, not showing any signs yet of abating. So to explain a little bit about what I do on a day-to-day -day basis um, to set the scene for my approach to this um, debate. I work in London. I'm a UK qualified lawyer. I advise on sanctions. From both perspectives, I advise on compliance, which is uh, increasingly a huge part of my work because of the complexity of sanctions and the need to understand how they apply in practice. But I also advise on the contentious aspects of sanctions when sanctions are breached and what reporting obligations might be sparked as a result. And that is something that uh, led me into sanctions in the first place because by training, I am a criminal defense lawyer, criminal defense solicitor. And in this country, as in many other countries, breaches of sanctions are quite severe criminal offences. The third type of work that I do, um, at least up until now, the present point in time, is, is challenge sanctions, cha challenge sanctions designations in court. And I've done that in the EU principally, as we now have a brand new autonomous sanctions regime in this country. Uh, following the UK's departure from the EU. We have 
yet to see these types of challenges being brought in the UK courts. And I may come on to discuss that in more detail if we have time. Um, but up until very recently, or more specifically, until the present uh, political situation, the landscape, the sanctions landscape, I wouldn't say it was straightforward, but it was certainly more straightforward than it is now. It had evolved incrementally over time, and we were now a long way away from the starting point, which was countrywide embargoes. The received wisdom was that those were too crude, there were too many collateral um, consequences, there, or collateral damage, I should say. There was um, a need for a more sophisticated approach and enter targeted sanctions or so-called smart sanctions, although it pains me to use that phrase. They, in theory, isolate the effect of the sanction on the targeted individual entity or sector. So we had the most common type of financial sanction, which is the full asset freeze. Uh, applied to individuals or entities that are named on a list. And importantly, and very, um, very, very uh, practically difficult to uh, deal with in practice, they extend beyond the individuals and entities on the actual list to capture also commercial interests that are owned and in some instances controlled by an individual or an entity on the list. So that's your financial sanction. Then you have your trade sanctions, which uh, as it says on the tin, bite on specified trade and specified goods, items, technologies. You would expect to see military goods, dual use goods, and then goods in certain key industries typically being targeted by those. And then you would see some peripheral trade sanctions, immigration sanctions for individuals. Um, but that was largely it until 2014 with the annexation of Crimea, we saw for the first time so-called capital market restrictions, which was a kind of light version of the full asset freeze, whereby key companies, state-owned companies in key sectors were subject to restrictions on dealing in debt and equity. So debt and equity issued after a certain date could not be touched uh, unless a specific exemption applied or without a license. And similarly, you can confer a loan or credit on these entities, but in all other respects, you were free to deal. And they took some time to get used to. I think it's fair to say there was a bedding in period for sure. Um, but that was um, by and large what we were used to dealing with. And in the present context, that was what the toolbox looked like when things started to deteriorate, deteriorate, politically speaking. And as we were watching events unfold as lawyers, that was also what we would expect to be deployed. Now, what then happened in practice was very interesting and I'll give you my take on it. Firstly, what was different this time around, in my view, was the lack of policy coordination, both in terms of timing and content. In response to other major political events, we would have expected more alignment on the policy front. And instead, we had the UK go first and announce a first wave of sanctions. A few hours later, the US announced their sanctions package and some considerable time later, 
the EU announces its first wave of sanctions. So I'm stopping with those three jurisdictions because um, obviously um, there are many more, but for the sake of simplicity here. And even though the timing <laughs> difference made sense in a way, the UK was now in a different position than it had been previously because it has uh, left the EU. It can, in theory, adopt sanctions at any time. It doesn't have to wait like the EU member states do for unanimity to be secured. Um, but what was very mar uh, remarkable was, was that the UK's sanctions differed in substance so much from the US. And then the EU sanctions that came later were also different in their turn from the US and the EU. What that means in practice is that the compliance burden becomes almost unmanageable because you're dealing with three very different situations at the same time overlapping because unlike many other laws, sanctions have a very wide extraterritorial effect and very unclear messages being received as to what's going to happen next. And that may have been entirely um, deliberate because the confusion, of course, above all means that you amplify the preventative effect, you amplify um, the, the reluctance to do anything at all uh, in a commercial sense before you are very clear about what the parameters are. So that was my first observation on what was different this time around from a legal perspective. And what we saw for the first time this time around was a much more in depth focus on the financial sector and specifically the proposal and subsequent impl implementation of those proposals of cutting banks off from SWIFT, the international messaging system that accompanies most electronic transfers. It's not unprecedented, but the scale and the context in which this occurred uh, made it very, very different from the previous limited experience that we had seen in the Iran uh, sanctions regime. And we also saw some very interesting expansions of the capital market restrictions that I mentioned that had been in place since 2014. So we're still reeling <laughs> from um, the impact of not just the policy, but also then the technical sanctions and working out exactly how they're meant to be interpreted and how they apply on the ground. And of course, there are more to come. But if I can wrap up my uh, intro with uh, one last observation, which is different this time around, and I was pleased to hear that it's something that you will be devoting some more attention to. The rule of law uh, issues, if I can call it that, um, which necessarily accompany sanctions had been brewing in the background. There had been some, uh, I would say, belated um, attention to the need for sanctions to be seen to be compliant with procedural rights in the UN. Uh, there had already been some uh, good developments in the EU and some concerns had been raised on that front when the UK's uh, new autonomous sanctions legislation was adopted back in 2018. But now, given the criticisms that have accompanied, uh, in particular, the UK's approach to sanctions and specifically the UK's failure to act quickly enough, the UK's perceived failure to act 
more uh, robustly, raises this rule of law issue again. And you will not have missed that lawyers have come in for a particular uh, critique and specifically lawyers who challenge sanctions. So I won't uh, tell you my view on that because you should be able to work it out. But the uh, rule of law debate, I hope, is one that will continue to be raised and one that I hope will gain more traction because I feel very strongly that this is the crux of sanctions. There has been a concern that we're adopting too many sanctions too quickly, uh, indiscriminately without worrying about where it is going to lead us in the future. The concern put differently is that we start to devalue sanctions by, uh, by, by not thinking more strategically about what type of sanctions we choose and how often we use it. Um, but more to the point, if we are seen to be adopting sanctions without paying any attention to the procedural protections that make all laws lawful, then we're playing straight into the hands of those who are sanctioned and who will quite obviously say that sanctions shouldn't be complied with, sanctions should be ignored because they are unlawful, because they do not comply with international law. So it is important for sanctions to continue to play a useful, meaningful function for them to comply with basic rule of law protections, basic rule of law standards, and principle amongst those would be human stroke procedural rights in my view so i will stop there i've probably exceeded my lot of time by some margin my apologies not at all thank you so much anna and and yeah you know we're you know here we're really we're interested in the, the nature of sanctions the effect that sanctions are or are likely to have but we're also very interested also in the rule of law implications you know the effect that the emergency has on sometimes ignoring uh, the rule of law. So we're, we're definitely interested in exploring that both today and, and next week. Uh, Elena, if I could uh, uh, maybe ask you to uh, join and give your, your comments for the seven or eight minutes, that would be fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, sure. Um, thank you, David, for putting together this uh, important event. And thanks, Anna, for these fascinating comments from the trenches of those who have to deal with all of the sanctions that are now being imposed and create a ton of uncertainty. Um, I'll try to elaborate on some of the points Anna made and also offer some big picture uh, comments uh, to add maybe a different perspective. Um, I want to start by acknowledging that we need to be mindful of the fact that things are still evolving. Um, and so I only offer some tentative thoughts and put out questions that I think would be uh, worth uh, discussing uh, today. Uh, so let me start by maybe offering an overview of what exactly is taking place, uh, adding to some of the points that Anna already made. Um, so the United States and the European Union primarily uh, have led an ambitious sanctions effort uh, that includes largely six different buckets of measures. Uh, the first bucket is about taxing Russian leadership, elites, uh, and the financial system, uh, including blocking sanctions against Putin, his cronies, uh, and major Russian banks and financial institutions, um, as well as, as Anna mentioned, the removal of certain financial institutions from SWIFT. Um, the second bucket is about ensuring sanctions effectiveness by crippling what uh, people started referring to as Fortress Russia. Uh, the reserves and the substantial uh, preparation that Russia has engaged in, in anticipation of the day when it faces uh, the kinds of sanctions that it is now facing following its invasion into the Ukraine. Uh, what we're talking about here is sanctions that aim to prevent Russia from undermining the impact of sanctions by accessing its sizable foreign reserves or trading in sovereign debt in the primary and secondary market. Um, both the US and the EU impose severe restrictions on transactions with Russia's central bank, 
Uh, and the United States has also spearheaded an international task force that will hunt down assets of Russian designated individuals and entities, uh, given the fact that we don't know uh, precisely where those assets are located and uh, the difficulty to reach those assets is one of the concerns uh, that have been raised about the effectiveness uh, of the current uh, economic campaign. Um, the third bucket, and perhaps most surprising in my view, uh, is the energy bucket. Uh, the United States recently banned the import of Russian oil, liquefied natural gas, and coal to the United States. Uh, it also banned U.S. person investment in the Russian energy sector. Uh, and that is surprising because at first, at least, the United States appeared to try to leave the energy market untouched uh, by creating all sorts of exceptions uh, in the sanctions that were imposed in the first rounds uh, for transactions uh, involving the Russian energy sector. Uh, but in what amounted to a fairly quick and surprising about phase, the United States just announced those measures that I think are uh, extraordinary uh, in many respects. Um, the fourth bucket is transportation. Russian airlines are now banned from large swaths of the world. Uh, the fifth, <clears throat> sorry, is export controls designed to curtail Russia's access to necessary commodities and technologies. Uh, and this may have a long-term effect on Russia's military preparedness and its ability to uh, access uh, advanced technologies. And finally, and importantly, uh, is um, the private sector. Uh, on top of the governmental sanctions that have been imposed, we've seen an exodus of private actors uh, from Russia in recent weeks since the Russian invasion. Um, uh, and it seems that what's taking place is above and beyond what's legally required uh, by sanctions. Uh, so uh, companies from BP to Apple and McDonald's have announced that they're stopping operations in uh, Russia, MasterCard and Visa suspended operations in Russia. Uh, and so those measures are extremely important uh, and we must not ignore them as we speak about the governmental uh, sanctions effort uh, and its uh, 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 impact and uh, shortcomings. Um, there are a number of things that I find uh, interesting or if you will, impressive uh, about this response. First, the speed. Uh, governments and private actors alike move through the escalation ladder at breakneck pace here. And as uh, Anna already said, uh, this creates a lot of uncertainty. It creates a lot of um, uh, compliance mess. Uh, and it's something that uh, we need to be mindful of. Um, we can think of comparable sanctions regimes in terms of severity and the elements that they included. Think about Iran, think about Syria. There are other examples. Uh, but in the Iran case, uh, sanctions buildup took years. Uh, and these crippling Russia sanctions were imposed in a matter of weeks. Uh, and I think uh, that is noteworthy. Um, Second, and here I think I disagree a little bit with what Anna said, I think uh, international coordination around the big picture issues uh, um, where it comes to the response, the economic response was quite impressive. Uh, I agree that there's divergence on the substance of the measures and uh, the major actors, the United, the United Kingdom, uh, the EU, the United States could have worked to better align uh, the specific content of the sanctions packages that they uh, put in place, uh, but coordination around the, the response and around the kinds of measures that needed to be taken in response to the Russian invasion, uh, I think uh, was uh, pretty impressive. Uh, and third, this is the first time I can recall that such extensive sanctions uh, are levied against a G20 economy that's so deeply integrated into the global economy. Uh, again, we've seen uh, comparable sanctions regimes in terms of severity in the past, uh, but never against a G20 economy uh, uh, on the scale of Russia. Um, so this is the descriptive uh, portion of my comments, uh, and I'd like to throw out some questions uh, that uh, these measures raise and I think are very important to uh, consider. Uh, first, um, sanctions are supposed to be a means to an end. Uh, the question is, what is the end game here? What happens if Russia doesn't retreat? Uh, are these crippling sanctions on the G20 economy sustainable in the long run? Uh, 
what will they do to the international economy beyond the immediate future? Um, I ask this, although I recognize that the sanctions have expressive value, uh, they've sent a clear message that Putin's invasion of Ukraine was a bridge too far. Uh, and after years of turning inward, uh, major international players managed to put up a united front and punish Putin for his actions. Uh, that's arguably good, uh, but what about the broader uh, implications? Um, the second question is, is it possible that uh, the actors who orchestrated uh, the sanctions regime um, ended up being a lot more effective than they, they wanted to? So in the first stages of the sanctions campaign, you saw this um, very uh, delicate balancing game on the one hand, trying to punish Russia, on the other hand, trying not to shock the international economic system too much, trying to protect uh, the stability of the energy market. Um, but that sort of went out the door pretty fast uh, with the energy measures and the more um, uh, severe measures that have been imposed in recent uh, days. Um, and it seems that private actors, as I mentioned, are over complying and taking actions to reduce their exposure to Russia out of an abundance of caution. Uh, and the question is, was this something that the architects of the sanctions regime really wanted? Uh, is it uh, something that sort of escaped their control and is now taken on a life of its own uh, in a way that can lead to undesirable effects that even the proponents of sanctions uh, did not intend? Um, the third important point, and again, this ties into uh, one of Anna's points, uh, is that um, it goes beyond without saying that Russia has caused uh, indescribable suffering in the Ukraine. Uh, but what about ordinary Russians that will also suffer immensely as a result of these sanctions? Um, and the perennial question about sanctions as a tool of statecraft is how to balance their legitimate policy objectives uh, with harm to civilian population and to individual rights, uh, due process, and other aspects of rule of law, again, as Anna um, uh, said. Uh, it is possible that ordinary Russians will rise up against Putin's regime and put an end to all of this, but that does not seem to be a likely scenario. So the challenge for us is to think about how to mitigate uh, these two competing interests going forward. Uh, and finally, a legal point, and this may go more to the United States, uh, the system I know uh, well. Um, U.S. sanctions have been imposed pursuant to extremely broad delegations of authority uh, to the president from Congress uh, decades ago. Uh, and those delegations of authority essentially allow the president to impose whatever sanction against whatever actor uh, at whatever level of severity. Um, this tool has been abused before. Uh, and the fact that it allows the United States president, the United States executive to impose these broad and crippling sanctions uh, raises a lot of questions about oversight, about control, about accountability, about due process uh, that need to be considered. And I think the uh, economic response to the Ukraine crisis, uh, justified as it may be, uh, highlights uh, these concerns uh, once again. So I'll stop here and I look forward to um, opening up discussion of these questions uh, with the audience. Thank you so much, Elena. And, and yeah, really interesting questions that you're raising that I think our other commentators are gonna, are gonna, are gonna look to as well, the actual, the implications and possibly the unintended uh, implications and consequences of the sanctions. Lee, if I could bring you in for your comments, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, thank you. So I'm not a lawyer. Um, for my sins, I'm a political scientist, so the, I will focus my comments on what the political implications of these sanctions will be. And I want to make uh, three main points in the time that I have. The first is that the sanctions that have been imposed on Russia have had very severe consequences on the Russian economy already, uh, much greater than was uh, initially imagined. So the ruble has lost 60% of its value against the dollar. Russian equities have collapsed by 70%. Uh, this has precipitated a run on the banks in Russia as citizens try to withdraw foreign currency before it all runs out. Uh, Russia's external debt rating has been uh, downgraded to junk status. Uh, 
and the technical default on Russia's external debt is highly likely. Overall, the estimated hit to Russian GDP will be something in the order of eight to nine percent. Um, now, that initial hit um, taken by the central banking sanctions, which are the most significant of all the sanctions that have been applied, was contained when the Russian central bank hiked interest rates from 9.5 to 20 percent. So they have managed to stabilize the rule and they've also implemented capital controls and are forcing companies to surrender foreign uh, currency. But that massive hike in interest rates will obviously have a knock on impact on economic growth. So it only compounds the likelihood that the Russian economy enters a steep uh, recession. The collapse of the ruble will also push import prices up, which will lead to inflationary effects in the economy. And given that 70% of Russia's non-food uh, non consumables are imported, that is going to have a very big impact on Russian consumers. The export restrictions on high-tech products is also going to have a particular effect on certain sectors of the Russian economy, such as anything to do with um, electronics. So we are looking at um, a set of sanctions that are so severe that they are unprecedented against the major economy, as we've just heard. There have been more severe sanctions in the past. For example, the comprehensive embargoes imposed on Iraq, which totally destroyed its economy and society. These sanctions are not so severe as that, but they are the most uh, serious sanctions that have ever been imposed on a major economy. It's also the case that these sanctions are already hitting the wider Russian population. These are not targeted sanctions. These are directed at the Russian population as a whole, whether by intent, it doesn't matter the intention, the effect is they are punishing ordinary Russians. The second point is that although it is clear that economic pain is being inflicted on the target here, we cannot jump from that to claim that sanctions are therefore working, as many people are now trying to claim. As we've just heard, um, sanctions are a means to an end, they are not an end in themselves. The purpose of inflicting uh, economic pain is to extract political gain, to gain some kind of concession from the target. Now that can come through a variety of mechanisms. It could come, for example, through compellence. So you actively deprive the target of the resources it needs to pursue a particular course of action, therefore forcing it to change course. That's one possible route. Another is political fracture, that you are trying to in induce splits in the regime, defections, uh, rebellions against the regime from the wider population, etc. That will bring about a change in government or force those in power to change course. No. So far, there is no evidence of the compellence mechanism being activated. If anything, uh, Putin's demands have only become uh, greater before the uh, invasion. He was demanding that uh, Ukraine be neutralized, become a neutral country, and uh, basically a neutral buffer zone be established between NATO and Russia. Now, he is making demands of the Ukrainian government to recognize the separatist um, so-called People's Republics in the East, and to recognize the, uh, the, the Russian seizure of Crimea. And these are demands that no self-respecting Ukrainian government could agree to. Now, these may be a bargaining ploy, but clearly compellence at the moment is not working. It's difficult to see um, how they could, at least in the short to medium term. As for political fracture, it's very hard for me to say uh, because I'm not a Russianist. And to really understand the impacts of sanctions on, on a society, you need somebody who is very well versed in Russia's political, in that target's political economy. You can copy sanctions word for word, dollar for dollar, from case to case, and it will have a totally different impact because what matters is the interaction between the instruments imposed and the target's political economy and the political dynamics in that society. However, uh, one can observe that in February, President Putin's approval rating was 71%. So this is a highly popular administration. Uh, by comparison, Boris Johnson's approval rating was 25%. Um, Putin's approval rating increased by 20% the last time that he attacked Ukraine, increased by 20%, despite the onset of sanctions. 
as of March, early March, 60% of Russians blamed the US and NATO for the Ukraine crisis, 2% blamed Russia. The oligarchs that we hear so much about uh, in Russia, they are subordinated to the regime rather than the other way around. This is one of the achievements, the political achievements of the Putin regime after the uh, anarchic years under Boris Yeltsin. Um, the Putin regime is very solidly grounded on a network of former state security officials and managers of state enterprises, and that network appears to be deep and relatively robust. Uh, there was a 400 to zero uh, vote in the Russian Duma, the parliament, on recognizing the breakaway republic. So there did not seem to be a great many elite fractures that uh, sanctions could exploit. As for the opposition, there is an anti-war opposition in Russia. There is an anti-Putin opposition in Russia, but obviously it has come under sustained assault in recent years. There's been a massive crackdown on civil and political liberties. And so the opportunities and organizations through which opponents of Putin, those harmed by sanctions, could transmit their anger uh, into state power are extremely limited. So what that means is that there is the possibility, which often happens in sanctions cases, of very serious economic pain being inflicted on the target without the political gain that the senders seek. And my final comment is that even if sanctions do bite very deeply, uh, we still need an off-ramp from this crisis. The question that Elena raised, what is the end game here, is the one that should be at the forefront of our minds. It seems very unlikely to me that Russia is simply going to implode or collapse as some uh, in the West are, are suggesting. And we have to question whether we would really want that to happen. Uh, do we want a vast nuclear armed state to collapse and implode? What will be the implications of that? It seems to me some people are intent on something like a rerun of the first Gulf War in 1990, where crippling sanctions are imposed to contain Russia and in the hope of regime change. And again, is that realistic? Is it desirable? What would be the human rights consequences for millions of Russian people? What would be the security consequences for the wider world of a collapse into state criminality? Because the criminalization of the state and state apparatuses is a common feature of um, states facing heavy sanctions as they try to develop ways to get around the sanctions. And the uh, a descent into unrest and potential anarchy. Is that really what we uh, want to achieve? Equally, some people seem to be hoping for a rerun of, the, uh, of Afghanistan in the 1980s, where the Russian war machine is bogged down into a grinding uh, counterinsurgency. Is that really what we want for the Ukrainian people who, who have faced war and devastation now for uh, eight years already? Syria is a cautionary tale of what happens when a civil war becomes internationalized and we end up with a proxy war between the great powers. It seems to me that ultimately only a negotiated solution can, uh, can end this conflict. And the centerpiece of any negotiated settlement that all parties can live with must be for Ukraine to become a neutral country. In other words, for NATO and the EU on one side, and Russia on the other side to stop fighting for the allegiance of Ukraine, for its integration into their competing spheres of influence, and for the Ukrainian elite to focus on the task of reuniting their fractured uh, country and pursuing a foreign policy that uh, is capable of reuniting the people. But that would, of course, require all sides, both in the West and Russia, to withdraw and cease uh, interfering in Ukraine's internal affairs. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. We'll bring, bring you in, John, for, for your comments on the systemic effects. So I am not a lawyer either. I'm an economist, but I'm interested in the impact on us from this whole episode, not the impact on Russia. And unlike my fellow panelists, I might be the only one who's been personally subject to British sanctions. So I have some personal angle in all of this. Now, the sanctions I was subject to were much stricter than anything now used on Russia. So it's an interesting world we live in. Uh, my interest is in systemic risk. Systemic risk is the highly unlikely chance 
and a big financial and economic crisis ensues, it is so costly that the cost will be in the trillions of euros here in, in Europe. Now, systemic risk is not about what we expect to happen. It's about what might happen. And therefore, it's a well-studied phenomenon. And we are interested in how to fight it. So how does this fit into it? If you ask the financial markets, and I was just looking at the numbers, the financial markets are not saying there's a, there's a greater risk to Germany today than it was the height of the COVID crisis. So the financial markets are predicting a really serious economic downturn in Europe over the next decades. And the, so, and, and, and so you may not believe in the financial markets, but this is what they are pricing in, worse on COVID. Now, how could that possibly happen? The key word is fear, fear, financial fear. And what is financial fear? It is, if you are a market participant, are you willing to go about your business in a normal way or do you withdraw, withdraw into your fortress? Do you protect yourself? What do you do business if you want to make it really simple? Systemic risk drive is, is part of fear. So how has Russia fed into this? Now, let's do a scenario from the worst to the mildest. There's a tool Russia has that we don't speak much about that's, that they haven't wielded yet. Russia could stop sending gas to, to Europe today. So ima imagine the impact on Germany and Italy and Great Britain and a bunch of other countries if gas stops. Now, the, you know, the house heating costs will quadruple after already tripling. Large number of industrial companies dependent on gas will, will, will grind to a halt. The political pressure on the government to stop this nonsense and settle will become significant. The way the financial industry will deal with this is fear goes up. Fear means you stop investing, you stop lending, the price of credit goes up, lending goes down, and those have money, they sit on it, they don't lend it out. So that's the worst scenario. Suppose we don't get into this, but suppose we're in a world where sanctions continue. Even if they don't even increase, fear is continually going up. So the longer the state lasts, the more the financial markets, the more the economic agents we tracked into the fortresses, we stop participating, that also kills the economy. And this is a feedback effect. So there's a feedback effect between fear and economic actions. And at the heart of every crisis we know, we have this mechanism, we have this feedback between fear and economic outcomes. If you want an analogy, the best historical an analogy I know is 1914. In the build up to World War I, and after World War I started, Great Britain suffered the worst financial crisis it's ever suffered. The government suspended all loan contracts for six months. They closed the London Stock Exchange for six months. Nothing like that has happened yet. So if you think of so. However, what led to that is eerily similar to what is happening today. So anyone looking for a historical study, that's a, that's a good case to start with. So you have this feedback mechanism between fear and economic outcomes, and either Russia stops supplying gas, or the second, the sanctions and the war continues. We will, we will likely end up there in either case. Now, nothing about this is pricing. Everybody knows this. That is in the was in the crisis business, and the government has a really nice, cool tool for solving this. You cut the feedback between fear and bad decisions. Those tools are liquidity, printing money, and the government borrowing to spend and help companies. Liquidity and government spending cut the cut the feedback. That's what we did in two thousand and eight. That's what we did in twenty twenty. And now, come the, now comes the bad news. <laughs> the, the central banks used up all the ammunition. The governments used up all the ammunition. Inflation is already 8%. You cannot use liquidity to solve this. You cannot use government spend expenditure to solve this. The banks are full of money. The system is so flush with liquidity, there's no to do with. 
The problem is the liquidity is not going from the pockets of those who have it to the pockets of those who need it, the firms. So if the Bank of England and the ECB wants want to do something about that, what they have to do is for the Bank of England to start lending itself. So we, we might see collateralized lending done directly by the central bank on a much bigger scale than it did in, 20, in 2008. Imagine the private sector capitalist banking system is not servicing the real economy, so the Bank of England starts doing it. You can see the political consequences of that action in, and, and how that feeds into future dialogue. And the government's being so government's being so indebted, they can't do anything about it. But let's say cost of commodities keeps on going up, increasing number of companies are in difficulties, the cost of heating your house, quadruples, etc. The government has to do something. Well, the problem is the economy is shrinking because you're taking all the money out for the commodities. So a smaller economic pie has to pay for more. There's only one outlet printing money. So that means inflation going up. And then we get to the doomsday scenario here. The doomsday scenario is what the economists call the bank government doom loop. The bank government doom loop is where governments are in difficulty, economies contracting, the banks where Europe own about 20% plus of government debt. Because the government is in difficulty, the difficulty feeds back onto the banks who contract. It then feeds back on government revenue in this vicious feedback between banks in difficulties and governments in difficulty. No, we have no way to, 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 to solve that particular problem. So finally, so plug this into a European political context. If you take certain European countries, take Spain, we'll take Italy. Spain, debt to GDP, 130%, maturity of the sovereign debt is seven years. This means Spain is rolling over about 20% of GDP is going to, 20% government revenue is going to service government debt every year. If inflation comes, what do you think happens to interest rates? They will shoot up across the maturity structure. How can Spain or how can Italy and how can all the European sovereigns finance themselves? Germany can deal with this. The Netherlands can deal with this, but not those sovereigns. And that we call it a European fragment. So you start in a fragmentation within the EU. So this is the doomsday scenario. And of course, this is understood by the policymakers. So a couple of the, 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 all the speakers have been discussing the end game or the cost. Well, if you see this cost in front of you, are you willing to continue on with the sanctions regime? Or do you want the problem to go away as quickly as possible before you get to that eventuality? And I think that is the interesting question. If you want to read about what I just discussed, I did publish a blog this morning on this subject, doing the analogy in 1914 on the economist's favorite blog page, boxeu.org. So you can download that if you want and see if you agree or disagree. Thank you, John. And colleagues, you're coming looking for hope in this seminar. Afraid <laughs> 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 there's not much of it. Um, so a fascinating uh, contribution from our four panelists. I think all of them connecting in different ways, right? Connecting to this idea that, that that we act, we act quickly, we celebrate that action, but then we start to think about some of the unintended consequences of action, unintended consequences for the rule of law. Uh, we've not thought hard enough about whether those sanctions will actually work in the context, the systemic context in which they land. And then clearly we've not thought hard enough about the potential, potential, I stress, systemic consequences of those sanctions. So, so much for us to talk about. I'm pretty sure that uh, an hour and a half of this seminar is not enough. But anyway, let's start. So let's open it up uh, uh, for questions uh, from the audience. Uh, we'll start with uh, uh, the in-person audience and uh, we'll keep an eye on the chat and bring in the Zoom as well. Um, Eva, if, if still your hand. Uh, um, a comment and a question. The comment is that we, of course, won the Cold War on economics. So the Soviet Union ultimately collapsed on economic grounds. Um, 
And the question is, to what extent or at what point do we believe the EU, the United States, the United Kingdom will try and influence the interest of the Ukrainian government to settle on a situation where they are neutral? Like, at, at what point do we think the pain inflicted on our economies will then, because if, if you look, for example, at Poland, Poland isn't a rich country and they are taking in very many refugees in circumstances where their health system is kind of creaky, their school system is kind of creaky. So, so I wonder, you know, when that when when that tipping point will be reached. Perhaps we can start um, um, you guys in the room and then see if uh, hopefully Elena and Anna you could hear, hear that hear that question. So, do you have any thoughts, Colin? Yeah, um, it's an interesting question, but it seems to me that the EU and NATO could have done this a long time ago. So, I mean, any sort of rational, any sort of rational assessment of the situation will reveal that the EU is not going to admit Ukraine as a member, um, because the EU is already reeling from the last round of expansion into um, Eastern Bloc states uh, and the political divisions and difficulties with enforcement. Uh, of EU rules uh, that has led to. And it, it, Brussels does not want to be saddled with what is now an economic basket case uh, in Ukraine. So that's not going to happen. Um, and equally with NATO, NATO cannot admit Ukraine because it's uh, the idea of neighboring states. I mean, the equivalent is if Canada wanted to join the Warsaw Pact, right? And we, we can just imagine how the United States would react to that. We don't need much of a leap because we can just think about how the United States reacted in 1961 when Cuba entered an alliance with the Soviet Union and nuclear missiles were placed on Cuba 90 kilometers off the uh, Florida coast. So to, to accept Ukraine into NATO would uh, raise uh, the stakes a lot and raise the possibility of direct military confrontation between NATO and Russia. And direct military confrontation between two nuclear blocks is profoundly dangerous. I mean, I can't, it's kind of amazing that I have to utter that sentence, uh, but some of the discussion over the past two weeks has been completely divorced from that reality. So the reality is that the EU and NATO are not going to admit Ukraine. However, Rather than simply saying that and saying, okay, we're not going to admit you and saying to Russia, okay, your security concerns, we're going to respond to that by not accepting Ukraine. They have, they have not clearly done so. The fact that President Zelensky went on television to demand immediate entry to the EU, to demand the NATO no-fly zone, shows that uh, there's at least enough ambiguity there for Ukrainian elites to either believe or to pretend to believe that admission is possible. So it, it was in the gift of EU and NATO to make it very clear long before uh, this, that this is not going to happen, uh, but they refused to do so. At the same time, they refused to do what would have been necessary to avert Russian intervention, which is to deter them militarily. Right? There are two choices you have given Russia's clearly stated security goals in Eastern Europe, <coughs> you either come to some kind of agreement and settlement, you know, like the Russians were asking all the way through the 90s, let's build a security architecture that includes the North Atlantic through to Russia, uh, or you can come to some kind of concerted concert kind of arrangement that at least satisfies Russia's security concerns. That's one possibility. The other one is you need to just deploy overwhelming military force to deter an attack, i.e. You bring, you bring Ukraine in, you station nukes in, in Ukraine. So the West has done neither of those things. Instead, it has recklessly dangled the prospect of EU and NATO membership in front of the Ukrainian elite, which has encouraged them uh, to pursue a course of integration with Russia's enemies, which would only fan Russian anxiety. So it's a strategic disaster from the perspective of Western geopolitics, 
and a humanitarian disaster on the ground for ordinary Ukrainians. So it was already in the West's gift and they didn't do it. And we have to ask the question why. Now, some people would say, oh, it's some kind of you know, three-dimensional chess to draw the Russians into a quagmire like Afghanistan. I mean, if that's the case, then you know, that's profoundly perverse, given how many people are going to die and suffer. We've got 2.1 million refugees already have left Ukraine. And that's just since the onset of this war. There's huge amounts of internal displacement in Ukraine because of the internal conflict since 2014. More likely is the strategic ineptitude that there has not been a clear uh, sense of what NATO is willing to actually do in Eastern Europe. And when the chips are down, you've seen this last week, right? There is going to be no, no fly zone. Poland can't even transfer jets to Ukraine by the US because they're worried that it will provoke an attack by Russia. And then the entire alliance will have to rush to Poland's defense. So you then have the potential for nuclear war. So this is the kind of, these are the sort of lack of strategic thinking that underpins this disaster. So they have it in their gift now. If they just say to the Ukrainians, sorry, you know, it ain't happening. And the Ukrainians will then have to make a very different kind of strategic choice. They will think very clear, you cannot rely on the EU, you cannot rely on NATO. So you have to pursue a course of foreign policy neutrality. And I just wish that that, and that is the obvious situation, right? That is revealed by facts. And I just wish that uh, that had been made much clearer earlier and that the Ukrainian elites had made a different set of strategic calculations. To, to, to bring someone else into the second loop, do, do, do you feel that in, in that response though, there is space for Ukrainian agency um, in terms of their sense of what they want to do? Mm -hmm. who, who, you know, which organizations they want to be a member sure. of, their, their transition to a form of democracy and, and free market economy that, that is more aligned with uh, uh, the European single market than it would be with Russia. So is there something missing from that account that is, is Ukrainian agency? Um, Ukrainian agency is part of the story that I've just told in the sense that Ukrainian elites took a certain view about where their destiny lay and it lay with the EU and NATO. Now, you are right that the Ukrainians are a sovereign people and if the Ukrainian people want to give away their sovereignty to the EU or to NATO, then you know, that's a matter for them. But the question about whether NATO and the EU will accept that is a question for them. So the, the, the best parallel that I can give you is, you can remember during the, um, the, the Brexit process, you, you had this kind of deluded attitude on the part of certain Tory Brexiteers that they could somehow leave the EU and maintain full access to the EU single market, as if, as if you know, regaining sovereignty from the EU just meant that they could still continue to do whatever they liked, as if, as if somehow a sovereign Britain would have a sovereign right to full access to the EU single market. No, the EU has it, had its interest, and its interest lay in making Brexit as difficult as possible for the UK to deter others from leaving. Right? They wanted to protect the integrity of their single market, so they weren't going to do it unless the UK continued to sacrifice its own sovereignty. So that was the political reality of the situation, and the, and the Tories had eventually to come to that realisation. So the, but my point is simply that the people of Ukraine do not have a sovereign right to enter into the EU and NATO because the EU and NATO are not going to do it. Um, I, I, I want to bring in Peter to the next question. Thank you, Lee. But if anybody wants to come in on, on, on Lee's comments here, I want to give some space for that too. Just sort of very quickly, coming off David's point. Nice, nice and loud, if you can. Uh, just coming off David's point. Uh, when you talk about the decision, the strategic decisions of Ukrainian elites, Russia was interfering in Ukraine before it uh, took Crimea. It had uh, arguably interfered with elections to get a puppet or someone that it liked uh, to help them be installed. What was the choice of Ukraine if not to side with the West? Because it sounds, it feels like the choice was wait for Russia to make the moves it was always planning to make and eclipse you, or try to reach out to the West. And the West, rather than saying, we don't want any part of this, 
made moves to allow that potentially to happen, which might have been an attempt to stave off further Russian intervention. Now, that's without denying the, the accuracy <coughs> of anything else you've said. I just wonder if there's more backstory that you're not accounting for. There's a huge amount of backstory, but I'm, I don't want to uh, absorb all the oxygen in the room. Um, but uh, the EU, the EU, so you're right that the EU and NATO responded to what was going on by sort of holding open half a door to join the Western club, but it was only ever half a door. And as you can see, they've now slammed it. And that was always going to be the case. So they, they really led Ukrainian elites up, a, up the garden path, really, in that sense, because they were never going to actually fully admit them and protect them. But that Ukrainian strategy relied on that. So I suppose what I'm saying is that sovereign governments can't do everything that they like, right? You can't have your cake and eat it, as we've learned over the last few years. Sovereign governments operate in a condition of geopolitical constraint and the interests of other powers. And what you have to try to do is to maximize the interests and well being of your own population within that context. And it's my contention that the best way to do that is for Ukraine to pursue a, a policy of neutrality internationally. I can't see any other way that you can reunite the country. I, I Sorry, uh, very quickly. I mean, so we. So no, no, I want to try and bring us back in the zone of sanctions, and I'll, I'll bring you very quickly, and I'll bring you in very quickly, Luke, and then I want to bring Peter in for to, to hopefully redirect us a little bit towards the question of sanctions. I know, colleagues, that there's so much to talk and debate about here, so maybe we'll stay till seven or eight o'clock. If, if that's all right. With you. So I bring you very briefly, and then Luke, and then Peter. Uh, just my very quick rejoinder is it doesn't feel like Russia was ever going to allow Ukraine to be neutral it had made moves that indicated it wanted to take it over so was the option really that you're contending the West should have taken leave Ukraine to be annexed I mean I, sorry I'll be is, is there right yeah, 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 bring you, I'll let Luke in and then I'll bring you for a very brief response and then Peter so we can move on Luke thanks um you know I, I know you're getting in the neck a bit here Lee but you know I, I probably agree with you about 80%, but I think there are a couple of things that need to be taken into account very quickly. The first is that you haven't said much about uh, Vladimir Putin here, and you know, obviously Russia is now a personal dictatorship, and uh, effectively now uh, he views uh, Ukraine as you know, a, te a territory to be annexed. If you read what he has literally said, not just recently, but also in the essay last summer, um, and, he, and he has gone far beyond what was necessary to deal with any rational kind of uh, security concern from NATO. I mean, he had already hobbled the eastern flank of Ukraine uh, from 2014 and had, and had essentially recaptured Crimea. So one of the reasons why this has been such a shock and has provoked such remarkable speed of sanctions is that uh, he has gone far beyond what was necessary to achieve that rational goal. And again, if you take him at his word, and there's no reason not to, it is because he doesn't believe that Ukraine should be uh, a country with any independence or sovereignty. And thus, uh, as the point was made, the definition here of neutrality matters a lot. I mean, Ireland is a neutral country, but has defense forces. His, uh, Putin's view of, of Ukraine is a neutral country that is demilitarized um, in, in his words, and that essentially has no capacity to even defend itself. So. There, there is a, a problem with the, the way that you have expressed, I think, about 20% of, of your, your view. Um, I mean, you are right that his, his rhetoric has become much more aggressive and denying the, the cultural distinctiveness and the right to a sort of independent nation for Ukraine over the last uh, several years, because this is a crisis that's been brewing for a very long time. Right, since 2008, when NATO stated that Georgia uh, and Ukraine would be ushered into uh, NATO, and Putin invaded Georgia, which indicated his unwillingness to allow those things to happen. He did then withdraw. He didn't conquer Georgia. Um, so it doesn't seem to me that there is, you know, there, it doesn't seem to me that there is that much strong evidence that he wishes to conquer the whole of Ukraine. My, my feeling is that he, will, he doesn't even have the capacity to do that, the military capability to do that. So my sense of what he's doing 
is that he seems to be inflicting lots of damage on the Ukrainian military in order to then hold the republics in the east if he can't get what he wants, which is a neutralized government in Ukraine. I should say that, and I did say, Russia should withdraw from Ukraine and stop meddling in its internal affairs. So what the problem here is the violation of Ukraine's sovereignty. That's the fundamental problem. And Russia obviously is involved in doing that, but he's doing that for a reason. There's a long backstory here of 20 years. It doesn't just start two weeks ago with, um, you know, madman uh, Putin trying to reestablish the Soviet Union as the propaganda would have it. So maybe if uh, NATO had come to an accommodation with Russia in the 90s, in the 2000s, even after 2014, would not see that kind of escalatory rhetoric to try to justify more and more Russian interference uh, in Ukraine. And I'll shut up because I'm not at all. Not at all about it. Just need to create some space for some other questions. So first of all, on online, if 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 you want to uh, throw something into the chat, or, or we've got a few questions here. I'll, I'll I'll try and bring a few of them in. Um, so um, uh, Peter, do you want to ask your question? Um, I'm a criminal law uh, guy, academic. Um, very much domestic, completely uninternational. So list, not knowing much about sanctions, I'm listening and I hear what may be a tension. I'm just interested in the view of all of you on it. But um, Lee, you, you suggested that, that uh, sanctions are uh, an instrument of, of a political instrument, uh, even by the sound of it, a, a war instrument. They're intended to produce effects, internal effects that, that would um, achieve your war aims. So. Uh, whereas Elena lets slip or, or said uh, that it was a punishment, um, which is particularly interesting to me as a criminal lawyer. Um, and I, is it one or the other? Are, are the two consistent? Uh, could, could it be both a punishment and a, a war aim? Or are, they, uh, is it, are the Russian sanctions really a punishment, whereas sanctions in some other place were really a war aim? So that, uh, and, the, and that raises two further questions in my mind, which is that if it is a punishment, then how that raises the question you raised, Lee, about um, what's the end game? As, a, as thinking about punishment in the domestic concept, but the context, the punishment of criminals, it's odd to think of negotiating with the person you're punishing. I can't, I, I literally can't get my head around what that means. Um, so um, there doesn't seem to be, you don't punish those who you're politically negotiating, or maybe you do. So that's a question. And then the other question is if it is, war making this is more to the lawyers i guess to anna and elena is that in presumably this is developed already but are lawyers then soldiers is that what lawyers have become war makers lawyers are the insofar as lawyers are involved in enforcing sanctions and sanctions now it seems are very much a routine part of what we do this is a big case it, it have, and i know there may be some literature on this but is that what's going on i'm not an international lawyer so but but is that appropriate? Should we be, we be worrying about lawyer, the legal profession being an instrument of war making? Okay, thank you, Peter. So, 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 two core questions there, right? Is is, is are the sanctions uh, war making, or are they or, or are they punishment, and what does that mean? And then the question: Are, are lawyers soldiers in this war? Um, so maybe uh, uh, Elena, I could bring you in first, and then maybe Anna, see if you have any thoughts or comments before we come uh, uh, to to us in the room. Uh, Elena, could I bring you in if you have any thoughts on that? Um, Sure. Sure. Uh, both excellent questions, and I've actually done some work uh, on the individualization of economic warfare and how that brings in bureaucracies and essentially sends bureaucracies to war. Uh, so I understand the impulse of the question, and I think it's very important. Um, the truth is that sanctions have existed um, in a sort of a liminal legal space. Uh, where in essence they are punishment, essentially, um, especially after the use of targeted sanctions that actually list individual people and organizations for their role in activity that is perceived to be nefarious, anything from corruption through terrorism to non-proliferation to being associated with regimes that uh, the European Union or the United States or Britain perceived uh, as uh, dangerous or uh, other, otherwise uh, violative of international norms. Um, so in essence, you are uh, si singling out an individual or company for 
their role in uh, what certain actors perceive to be um, uh, nefarious activity and imposing severe punishment sanctions uh, in the form of asset freezes, travel restrictions, uh, and associated uh, measures. So in that sense, I think it's fair to view this as punishment. Uh, but in terms of where this whole uh, mechanism is placed within the legal systems that have led the charge, uh, of imposing targeted sanctions, it exists in uh, an area that's defined as the foreign policy competence uh, of um, both the European Union and the United States. Uh, um, different sets of rules apply to those measures than to typical domestic policy making. Um, at least in the United States, it's very, very, very difficult to challenge targeted sanctions in the courts. Uh, there are literally I don't know, maybe a dozen cases uh, that have addressed this question straight on and uh, due process issues that arise with respect to uh, targeted sanctions. Um, and so while uh, targeted sanctions have characteristics of punishment, uh, they exist in a space that is um, affiliated with foreign policy authorities that are perceived to be extraordinary, exceptional, deserving of special legal treatment. Uh, and we can wonder if that's appropriate. Um, and on the second part of your question, does this turn lawyers into soldiers? Um, I think it's not a good comparison to make, uh, but I think it does bring lawyers in uh, more um, intimately and more actively uh, into foreign policy making and into uh, sanctioning, sanctioning may be the wrong word, but into um, approving and facilitating the imposition of uh, pretty severe economic restrictions on individuals. Um, and we have seen an increased role for bureaucracies in both the European Union and the United States uh, in this um, uh, endeavor. Um, I think those are my thoughts on this question. I'd be happy to hear um, what my co-panelists have to say. Thank you, Elena. And, and uh, Anna, maybe I could... Uh, Bring you on 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 in, on in this question. Maybe you, you could say you know maybe a little bit more in response to Peter's idea that lawyers being uh, you know soldiers in in a war is is, is connecting to your rule of law concerns and maybe you could say a little bit more about that as well. In which you know so so you know if 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 lawyers are performing a role in actually driving risk aversion, so more people are affected by these sanctions. People who probably maybe in some instances shouldn't have been. Uh, and, and their rights are ignored and trammeled over. But then I guess the response might be in, a, in an emergency, you know, necessarily the rule of law is, is pushed to, 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 to one side. Um, so I wonder whether you could combine you know, your answer in relation to Peter's question with some further thoughts upon your rule of law concerns. Sure, sure. And can I start by thanking, um, thanking you for those questions because they are truly <laughs> good questions. And I just wish more people um, had, had thought along those lines because they raised two very practical issues which are very close to my heart. First of all, the received wisdom or the approach taken so far by, in particular, the Court of uh, Justice in the EU uh, is that sanctions are not punitive. They are not equivalent to criminal punishment and therefore as a result they do not attract the full article 6 fair trial right protections and that to my mind is a very odd situation because if you compare the impact of an asset freeze imposed by sanctions against or if you compare it with uh, an asset freeze imposed Oh, in yeah. support of a criminal investigation what? or a civil uh, action. I spoke then... to the defence guy, and I just, I just. Sorry, Anna. Someone was talking over you. Sorry. <laughs> it sounded like it was, uh, they were talking to one of their clients. <laughs> ah, lovely. <laughs> Sorry. Um, then, then the effect in practice is far more um, invasive, pervasive famously described as a financial death penalty and to maintain the line that these are not punitive is, is to my mind artificial um, but 
where does it take us? Because obviously it's a policy question as well. And I love the way the question was phrased. You don't punish those you negotiate with. And that was also a strategic question that came up in the US Treasury's review of the US sanctions regimes adopted to date. It was published last year and it made the very interesting observation that sanctions do need to have some carrot uh, stick isn't enough. The stick approach um, isn't going to be sufficient necessarily because if your goal is to uh, achieve a regime change or a, a change in attitude on the part of the targeted regime, then what is in it for them? Um, that is something that I'm not well placed to answer, but those are my ob observations and. A further observation here is the increasing blurring of the lines between criminal law and sanctions, which is deeply worrying and which we're seeing play out very clearly in the UK in connection with the present, um, present situation. And the uh, blurring is this, we are increasingly seeing sanctions being imposed for criminal conduct. We saw it with the uh, adoption of the UK's first um, anti-corruption, uh, global anti-corruption sanctions, but also in the adoption of sanctions under country regimes or under other um, activity-based regimes in the reasons for the sanctions designation, often you'll see allegations of criminal conduct and they may be allegations of criminal conduct that have never been uh, the subject of a criminal investigation, um, let alone uh, a prosecution or, or judicial scrutiny in some other form. So it's a way of almost getting criminal law in through the back door. And in parallel, we've seen the use of criminal law in a political way akin to the way we use sanctions and uh, the best example I can think of at the top of my head is the economic crime bill which we expect to be adopted on Monday and that is specifically uh, legislation introduced in response to the perception that the UK is not doing enough by way of sanctions in response to the current crisis. And I wonder there if that is a helpful or beneficial or ultimately uh, useful <laughs> way forward. And again, the, the debate needs to happen. And I'm very, very glad to hear those questions being raised for that reason. Finally, the question of whether lawyers have become soldiers. And uh, I particularly like that, um, <laughs> that concept because we had lawyers as gatekeepers in connection with the war against crime. And lawyers as gatekeepers has always been pro problematic because it's good for lawyers to obviously know who their clients are and to take reasonable steps to not be misled and to uh, keep an eye out for uh, anything that suggests that the client might be seeking your legal advice for purposes that are unlawful. But in the final instance, lawyers are different from bankers. Lawyers are different from other professions because the door they keep open is access to justice. And here, it's not even a question anymore to my mind the door to justice is being shut in the UK if you close off the avenue for legal challenges to be brought, if you, practically speaking, name and shame lawyers in Parliament um, in connection with uh, uh, allegations that they are not there to answer. And so, I see that as a worrying development. And the final point that was uh, made in response to that question, the, the impact of over uh, compliance and practice and the tendency towards 
uh, overbroad interpretations of the scope of sanctions whenever there is uncertainty is a real one. We've lived for many years now with what has been called de-risking, and we've seen it in the financial sector in particular with banks closing bank accounts that are simply too costly to operate from a compliance perspective. If the risk goes up, then financially speaking, the costs of uh, performing all the due diligence uh, becomes at some point prohibitive. Uh, this is exactly what is happening in the legal sector. And you can only look at the news over the last couple of weeks of how many law firms have publicly announced that they are ceasing to do any Russia related work. Um, again, I'm not sure that is a, a good development, but um, I'm not a policymaker. I'm a humble lawyer. Thank you, Anna. So, so, sure, absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, if we're gatekeepers, Anna, right? Lawyers, the lawyers in this room, we're gatekeepers for the rule of law, right? It's what we tell our, our students. So, uh, I've got two more questions. John, as we, we are running out of time. Um, we're going to probably have to finish your five. So, John, a quick answer to that, and I want to bring two more questions in. I also had a question for you, John, but I think I'm not even going to be able to ask it. So, go ahead. <laughs> now, the as far as I know, there is no not a single case ever in history where sanctions changed any government's view. So they have, except in for small democracies. There are plenty of examples where governments welcomed sanctions because they become a tool for internal propaganda. Therefore, sanctions are not an instrument of war. They are not a punishment. I think all they are is, a, is an outlet for moral outrage. Would that give these lawyers? I have no idea. Thank you, John. So two questions, the gentleman over there and the student. Thank you for the discussion so far. Um, my, my question is, going back to the point of sanctions being a means to an end, um, perhaps what happened even before sanctions came in, or perhaps what's been more effective, as previously mentioned, was the exodus of the private sector from Russia. In terms of various lawyers, consultants, bankers, accountants just moving out of Russia, where do you think the disruption that has caused fits in with the broader picture of public sanctions imposed by governments? Yeah, just bring the question, then we'll bring the panel in. So, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, my question goes to Helen and the economists. By the way, everything was doing fine until you spoke. <laughs> but uh, so, the economic crime bill is uh, was pushed uh, forward due to the political pressure. So, in terms of uh, this law and the traceability of the ownership, the beneficiary ownership of Russian assets, what would be the next step? Like, is it possible to freeze those assets? And what would be like the systemic uh, consequences in the economy, uh, spe specifically in the UK economy? So we could bring the family panelists in the room for the answer those two questions. And sorry, brief if you could, please, gentlemen. So, so I can respond to both together. Okay. I think the formal sanctions are less important than the political sanctions, that is, political popular sanctions. Freezing assets has practically no systemic impact by itself. Cutting Russia off by itself has no systemic impact whatsoever. Because if anything, it reduces systemic risk because you've reduced the connectedness in the system. And therefore, if you just cut Russia off, you make the system more stable. It's the informal or political or popular sanctions that are much, much more damaging. So it is how we are, since all these companies were no, not doing business in Russia, et cetera, et cetera. That is because of fear, and fear is what drives systemic risk. So I think the so, so the formal sanctions are much less important than the informal, whatever label you want to give them. Uh, just to come back to Peter's really fascinating questions about punishment. So as Anna says, usually the senders of sanctions deny that they are for punishment. They, they, they say, no, that's not what this is about. Um, but I think uh, Anna's quite right that, in fact, that is not true. There are basically three kinds of uh, goals that policymakers have when they impose sanctions. There are target-related goals. So the ostensible target and sanctions, I want you to do this, this, and this. There are sender-related goals, goals that are about us, 
So it can be about satisfying the demand that something must be done, uh, virtue signaling and so on. It can be, some people are saying the sanctions are good because it will help decouple the UK economy from um, the kleptocracies in the East. That's a sender related goal. Then there's a system related goal. So you may not have any hope of coercing the target, but you want to send a signal to others who may be minded to do the same thing and say there are going to be costs. So you're trying to use it to uphold the particular system of laws, rules, norms. And when, you, when that is involved, the senders of sanctions are, of course, um, arrogating to themselves the role of a world government, um, enforcing the laws. And obviously, in an anarchic international context, we don't have an international government to enforce laws. That's why international law is not the same as domestic law. Um, but obviously, that means enforcement internationally is always going to be uneven because the sending countries are never going to sanction themselves. So that's why Gordon Brown, for example, could call for uh, war crimes prosecution for um, Putin and his friends and not the government that he was part of uh, when it invaded uh, Iraq, for example. Um, can you negotiate with someone you're punishing? Um, well, you, you can if you use the, the, the lifting of sanctions as a bargaining chip, as we've just, just heard. But the difficulty is that when you're engaged in punishment, you usually, to legitimise that punishment, you have to stigmatise the target, to delegitimise them, even to demonise them. And that then makes it very difficult to say, OK, if you, you know, do this, this, and this, we'll alleviate sanctions on you, we'll kind of rehabilitate you in the criminal law parallel. So you don't bargain with Hitler, right? because Hitler's evil. And the only way that you can stop him is to destroy him. So when Putin is compared to Hitler and demonized as Hitler and so on and so forth, it becomes very difficult to see how you could possibly bargain with him. That's why when we go down that route, there is an inherent escalatory process that takes us towards permanent sanctions looking at regime change, because this is not something that we, cannot, we can share a continent with and learn to live alongside. This is just an evil person that we've got to punish and destroy. And we're almost out of time, so I'm going to quickly have one minute to go, and I'm going to abuse Chair's privilege with two quick questions to you both to try and hit maybe a more slightly more hopeful note about the effectiveness of these things, or perhaps a less a depressing note about the downside, and I'm just pushing back. So, first of all, uh, Lee, on your claims that that these things, you know, we need to understand how they land. Do they uh, generate? Um, um, uh, do they fracture the government in, in in Russia? Do they foster opposition? I guess one thought I had is, is and obviously I know nothing about Russia as well. Is that one thing is perhaps missing from your uh, your analysis here is time. It's it's just too early to know whether it will do early, either of those two things. So I wonder what you thought about that question, and John. So in relation to your 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 really worrying assessment of of of, of the implications of this and the absence of tools to address it, mostly the absence of the ability to print money, quantitative easing, etc. I guess my one of my initial responses as you spoke was, well, didn't didn't we hear this during COVID? Right during COVID, we kept hearing the claim that if we do this. If we effectively print money, which is what happened, inflation will rise, inflation will get out of control, the economy will collapse. I think many of us, including myself, were really thought that that was a real possibility. And I guess the response is, well, it didn't happen. So there's a lot more, there's a lot more in the tank, you may, might say, to try and do what you were describing of, of decoupling uh, fear and economic uh, uh, decline. Long questions. We only have a couple of minutes for short answers. So Lee, perhaps you can go first. So the, the quantitative research on sanctions suggests that the long the sanctions go on, the less successful they are. So the, if you believe the quantitative research, and I don't think it's entirely beyond criticism, but if you believe it, the message is a short, sharp shock is better. Um, so some sanctions will take more of an effect longer term. So things like the technology export bans, for example, that will take longer to feed through in the Russian economy. But the longer the sanctions continue, the more opportunity there is for sanctions evasion. So Russia and Russian banks are sanctioned, but the intermediaries that Russia can work through, such as banks in Kazakhstan or Belarus or China, uh, you know, the smuggling networks that can get components in, it's very difficult to go after all of those unless you, you know, you somehow police Russia's international borders, which is you know, not feasible. So the longer that sanctions go on, the more, as I say, criminal networks will spark up and interact with the state, the state itself may become criminalized to evade sanctions. So you are right that 
the longer term impact is not the same as the short term impact, but the record of sanctions more generally in, in most cases is that the longer sanctions last, the less likely they are to achieve their goal. If you print little money, you would not get inflation. If you print infinite amounts of money, you would get huge inflation. And at some point, as you keep on printing, you will get inflation. That is a, just a law of nature. But we now, I think the COVID quantitative easing was a huge mistake. I think the central bank should not have done it. I think they misread the situation. They addressed COVID as they addressed 2008, which was a liquidity crisis. COVID was a demand crisis, a wrong response. And now with all this money hitting the system at the same time as the post COVID savings and everything is hitting us at the same time, that is driving that inflation. And now inflation is hitting eight, one in the United States now almost 9% today, on the Euros on 8%, 8%. Salaries are going up. So the inflationary expectations are already set. We already crossed the line. Colleagues, we're out of time, so I just wanted to also take two seconds to thank our panelists today, our four panelists, that I think did an absolutely fabulous job, so fast. Thank you. thank you, Anna, thank you, Elena, thank you so much.